குட் ஈவினிங் ஆஸ் ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் வெல்கம் டு த ஹிந்து நியூஸ் அனலிசிஸ் பை சங்கர் ஐஎஸ் அகாடமி ஃபார் த டேட் டுவெண்ட்டி சிக்ஸ்த் ஆஃப் ஆகஸ்ட் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி த்ரீ டிஸ்பிளேட் ஹியர் ஆர் த லிஸ்ட் ஆஃப் நியூஸ் ஆர்டிகல்ஸ் வி வில் பி கோயிங் த்ரூ டுடே பிஃபோர் கெட்டிங் இன் டூ த டிஸ்கஷன் ஐ ஹவ் டூ அனௌன்ஸ்மெண்ட் டு மேக் ஒன் இஸ் தட் அஸ் ஐ ஹவ் ஆல்ரெடி மென்ஷன்ட் த மச் அவைட்டட் சங்கர் ப்ரீ ஸ்ட்ராமிங் ஃபிலிம்ஸ் டெஸ்ட் சீரீஸ் இஸ் அபவுட் டு ஸ்டார்ட் த டெஸ்ட் சீரீஸ் இஸ் கோயிங் டு ஸ்டார்ட் ஃப்ரம் லெவன்த் செப்டம்பர் அண்ட் த ஃபஸ்ட் டெஸ்ட் இஸ் ஆன் எயிட்டீன் செப்டம்பர் the other details regarding the test series are displayed here for your reference the second announcement is that the all india open mock test for mains 2023 is going to be conducted by the shankara ais academy the test is going to start on 1st september the other details regarding the open mock test can be accessed by the link given in the description people who are appearing for the 2023 mains examination please make use of this opportunity to boost your main scores okay with this two announcements now without wasting time let us get into the news article discussion now take a look at this article as we all know recently there was a major ethnic violence that happened between the maiti and the kukki tribal people in the state of manipur during the event of violence many crimes were committed against women and children so the victims of the crime and some social activist have filed complaints before various police stations in manipur and the cases were being heard by the Manipur High Court. Later, based on the demands of the victims, all the cases were transferred from the Manipur Police to the Central Bureau of Investigation, that is the CBI. This was done to ensure fair investigation of the cases. Recently, the Solicitor General of India, Mr. Tushar Mehta, made an application before the Supreme Court. The application sought to transfer all the pre-trial hearings of the cases from Manipur High Court to Assam that is the Gauhati High Court the solicitor general indicated that judicial officers of Manipur may belong to one particular tribal community or the other so that pre trial hearings in Manipur may cause an apprehension of bias citing all these reasons the solicitor general requested the supreme court to transfer the pre trial hearings to the Gauhati High Court The Solicitor General said that Assam was chosen because it shares a land border with Manipur. So yesterday, the Supreme Court passed an order on the application of the Solicitor General. The Supreme Court, as the Solicitor General requested, has allowed the transfer of cases to Assam. The Supreme Court also mentioned that it would transfer back the cases to Manipur High Court if the state returns to normalcy. This is all about the news article. So in our discussion today, we will understand the powers of the Supreme Court in transferring cases and appeals. As we all know, the Supreme Court is the highest judicial body in our country. And it has the largest authority regarding the administrative functions of all its subordinate courts, which includes high courts and the district courts. The Supreme Court is also vested with wide discretionary powers to transfer any cases to from one high court to other see this power of the supreme court is provided under section 406 of the crpc 1973 as per this section a supreme court can make any such order to transfer any specific case or appeal or any matter that is pending before one high court to another high court see this power is given to the supreme court to ensure the principle of fair and equitable justice okay now comes the question who can make the application for the transfer of the cases see the application can be moved by any person who suspect that there is unfair action in the court or he or she may not find proper justice the application can also be made by the attorney general or the solicitor general of india on receiving the application the supreme court will hear the concerns of the applicants during such hearing the applicant should reasonably substantiate his contentions regarding the application after the hearing the supreme court may pass orders on the transfer of cases from one high court to the other here you have to note that the supreme court is not obligated to transfer the cases when it receives the application on such matters it is the discretion of the supreme court to decide whether to transfer the cases or not okay that is all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw the power of the supreme court to transfer cases from one high court to other to ensure fair and equitable justice okay 
Now with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Now take a look at this editorial article. See one of the significant outcome of the 15th BRICS summit is that the addition of new membership. Recently six new members that is Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates were given memberships in the BRICS grouping. Their membership will take effect on 1st January 2024. The editorial here highlights the performance of BRICS and the, and the negative implication of expansion of BRICS. See aspirants, yesterday we discussed elaborately about the significance of adding new members to the BRICS grouping. So, before looking at the negative implication, I suggest you to watch yesterday's daily news analysis. It will give you a holistic understanding about the BRICS expansion. Now, in today's discussion, we will mainly focus upon the negative implications of BRICS expansion. See, already the members of the BRICS like China and India are in a conflict mode. This is mainly due to bilateral issues like border clashes, unbalanced trade, territorial claims and etc. These issues currently affect the functioning of the BRICS as a whole. Bilateral issues between India and China is creating differences rather than consensus while taking important decisions in BRICS. So it is said that the bilateral issue between India and China has slowed the functioning of BRICS. If this is the case, the BRICS has added Iran, Saudi Arabia and UAE to join BRICS. As we all know, there is a rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia and Iran and UAE. This is because of ideological, political and religious differences. So, adding them to BRICS would further slow down the performance of BRICS rather than increasing the performance. This is the first negative implication of the membership addition. Secondly, the new addition might anger the Western powers, mainly the United States, who has been our ally for quite some time. See, already BRICS is seen as a forum to counter the US-led G7 grouping. And as we all know, Iran is a rival of the United States. So adding Iran to BRICS grouping will further project to the world that BRICS is politically anti-Western or anti-US. This will further create tensions to countries like India, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and UAE who are currently maintaining friendly relationship with the United States. This is the second negative implication. Finally. As many countries are added to the BRICS grouping, there is a possibility that China might attempt to overpower the BRICS grouping with its strategic and economic vision. This is because China is currently aspiring to become a world superpower. So China's superpower ambition might endanger the strategic autonomy of the BRICS members. These are some of the negative implications of BRICS expansion that is mentioned in this editorial article. Okay, so to conclude, the BRICS should make sure that it will work based on principle of shared prosperity and it will also allow more democratic model of global governance. This will attract more members to the grouping and help in the effective functioning of the grouping. So with this, let us conclude this discussion. See, yesterday we covered the significance of the addition and today we saw the negative implication. If you combine both, you will get a holistic picture and a holistic understanding about the recent membership expansion of BRICS. So with this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Take a look at this editorial article. This editorial article talks about the greening of the economy. The context behind this editorial is that our Prime Minister recently in his Independence Day speech mentioned that India is showing the world how to combat climate change. He also mentioned that climate action cannot be adopted by compromising economic development. The editorial here talks about what is green energy paradigm, how greening of economy can be done in rural areas and the steps that the government must take to encourage greening of economy. So in this context in our discussion today, let us quickly learn about what is greening of the economy the challenges associated with it and the steps that the government must take to green the economy. Before getting into the discussion, I have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion. You can go through it. First, what is greening of the economy or what is green economy paradigm? See, development often harms the environment. 
for example cutting down of rainforest for coal mining in assam but focusing only on the environment can slow down progress for instance there is a valuable green energy source called methane hydrate in krishna godavari basin but mining it could lead to problems like ground collapse and floods see the greening of the economy or green economy paradigm is a idea that aims to balance both development and the environment it wants to find ways to grow economically while also taking care of the nature it tries to make choices that benefit both our needs and the planet's health this new approach is all about finding ways to make our world better by using resources wisely and taking care of the environment it's like a plan for doing things in a way that helps nature reduces pollution and make sure there is enough for everyone now and also in the future this is about green economy paradigm now let me help you understand by providing some examples let us take electric cars by adopting electric cars and building more electric charging station more jobs will be created which will help the economy in addition to this if these electric vehicles are powered using renewable resources like solar park it will also aid in combating climate change here development is coupled with climate action next to take millet cultivation millets are hardy and climate resilient crops in addition to this millets have less carbon footprint compared to rice or wheat in recent times with the increasing awareness about the health benefits of millets farmers can make good profits by cultivating and selling millets so millet cultivation aids in the economic development of the farmer and also conserves the environment these are some examples of greening of the economy or green economy paradigm okay but adopting this has certain problems there are some hurdles in adopting green economy paradigm now let us see them one by one first hurdle is there is lack of awareness about the advantages of greening of economy then there is the issue of cost see green technologies and the practices often require initial investments that can be very expensive this can be a challenge for government or businesses or individuals mainly in the developing countries then there is the issue of skill mismatch see workers in the traditional sectors like fossil fuels might need to learn new skills for the green jobs that will be developed by adopting green technology providing new skills will take some time finally there is the issue of behavioral change shifting to a green economy often requires a change in behavior and consumption pattern this transition can be hard for people who are accustomed to the traditional ways see these are some of the challenges associated with adopting green economy paradigm the author of the editorial here provides some steps that can be taken by the government to address these hurdles now let us see the steps mentioned by the author the first one is using existing government programs take the pradhan mantri mudra yojana for example through the program the government provides collateral free loans for micro entrepreneurs through the scheme government can extend loans to small businesses that adopt green technology then take the pradhan mantri formalization of micro food processing enterprises scheme this scheme provides support for the adoption of technology among the micro food enterprises through this scheme government can help food processing units adopt green technology like solar dryers energy efficient multi purpose food processor or a solar grain mill finally take the pradhan mantri matsya sampatha yojana through this program government can help the fishing community adopt green technology like solar refrigerator and solar dryers like this existing government programs can be slightly modified to help people adopt green technology secondly the author talks about ensuring large scale financing from the banking institutions to ensure large scale financing from the banking institution support must be provided to them by the government government needs to help banks understand and assess clean technology projects for financing see traditional banks might not have experience with such new and innovative projects so they need support from the government to evaluate if green technology is a good investment or not government can also help reduce the risk of the banks by providing guarantee for the part of the investment made by the banks 
Additionally, government needs to work closely with the banks to design loans in such a way that both the banks and the people adopting green technology will earn at the same time. In this way, more money can be invested in green technology solution. This will also fast forward the adoption of green technology and helps in the greening of the economy. Okay. Finally, the author mentions about a partnership that must be created between people involved in green technology like inventors, manufacturers, retailers and banks. The author mentions about a complete system from top to bottom. This means distributors must work with manufacturers to make sure technology reaches the customers. The service providers must make sure that customers get help even after they buy the product. Then people in marketing must make sure that the green tech products must reach the right consumers. And the banks must also properly identify potential entrepreneurs for adopting green technology. This can be made sure only if all the stakeholders cooperate with each other. For example, some companies that make solar dryers don't just sell the dryers. They also help the customers to get loans to buy the dryers and they also buy the dried food from the customers. This kind of teamwork makes faster adoption of green technology. Okay, so that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw what is greening of the economy or green economy paradigm. Then we saw the challenges in greening of the economy. And finally, we saw three steps mentioned by the author in this editorial that will help in the faster adoption of green technology or the faster greening of the economy. So that's all regarding this discussion. Now with this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this editorial article. This editorial is about the recently concluded 2023 Chess World Cup. The 2023 Chess World Cup took place in Baku, Azerbaijan. It was the 10th edition of the Chess World Cup. It was conducted from 30th July to 24th August 2023. Around 206 players from different countries have participated in this tournament. Magnus Carlsen, who is a Norwegian chess player, came at the top of the tournament. At the final match, he defeated the 18-year-old R. Pragananda, who is a chess player from Chennai. See, Magnus Carlsen is a five-time world champion and uh, this is his first chess world cup. Here you have to note that the World Chess Championship is different from the Chess World Cup. This is the essence of the editorial given here. Now, why is this editorial important? Recently, UPSC has started asking sports related current affairs questions in the prelims examination. For example, in the 2023 UPSC prelims, there was a question about the Chess Olympiad. Now, why did the UPSC ask this question? This is because the 2022 Chess Olympiad was conducted in Chennai and it also appeared frequently in the news. Likewise, the 2023 Chess World Cup is also important current affairs topic for the next year's prelims examination. This is because one of the finalists of the game was from India. So, UPSC might ask a question about the 2023 Chess World Cup in the forthcoming prelims examination. This is what makes this editorial important. Now we will see some of the points about Chess World Cup. The Chess World Cup is a major chess event in the club. Until 2002, the World Cup was conducted under different names at different times. But from 2000, the World Cup event was formalized and it is being organized by the International Chess Federation. Currently, the event is being organized once every two years. Until 2005, the Chess World Cup had been played by 128 participants, but in 2021, the number of participants increased from 128 to 206. So now, the World Cup is played by 206 players. Note that from 2005, the Chess World Cup has been acting as a qualifying event for the World Chess Championship. This means that some of the top players of the Chess World Cup have been chosen to take part in the World Chess Championship. This is about the Chess World Cup. As I mentioned about the International Chess Federation, now we will see some points about this organization. The International Chess Federation was founded in Paris 
on July 20, 1924. Despite being founded in Paris, it is now headquartered in Switzerland. Note that the founding day of the Federation, that is July 20, is annually celebrated as the International Chess Day. The International Chess Federation is commonly referred as FIDA. Know that FIDA is a French acronym for the term Federation Internationale des Chess. The FIDA acts as a governing body of the International Chess Championships like Chess World Cup and the World Chess Championship. Know that the motto of FIDA is We Are One Family. That's all regarding this discussion. Just revise the facts that we discussed here so that it will help you in the prelims examination. Okay. Now with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article. This article is about the Chandrayaan 3 mission. The article here highlights various points that are relevant for the examination. Now let us understand the points mentioned in this article in detail. First, let us understand what is the near side and far side of the moon. The near side and the far side of the moon refers to the two hemispheres of the moon as seen from the earth. Their near side is the side of the moon that is always facing the earth. And the far side is the side that is not visible from earth. See, the moon is tidally locked with the earth, which means that the moon's rotation period is same as its orbital period around earth. This results in same side of the moon always facing the earth and the opposite side always facing away from the earth. This is why we see only the near side of the moon from the earth. Okay, The far side of the moon is also called the dark side. But you have to note here that the dark side of the moon also receives sunlight. During the new moon phase, when moon is present between the sun and the earth, the far side or the dark side of the moon receives full sunlight, as you can see in the image given here. So basically, the far side of the moon is called the dark side not because it receives no sunlight, but because it is the least explored side of the moon. The far side of the moon was not visible to humans until spacecrafts were sent to explore it. The Soviet Union's Luna 3 mission in 1959 captured the first images of the far side of the moon. And subsequent missions have provided more detailed mapping and images of the far side. Astronauts in the Apollo 8 mission of 1968 were the first humans to see the far side of the moon. Now, how is the dark side or the far side of the moon different from the near side? The primary distinction between the two lunar side lies in their physical characteristics. The near side has smoother surface with expansive volcanic plains compared to the far side. But in the far side, there are craters spanning thousands of kilometers. This is due to collision with asteroids over time. Although the near side also has some craters created by asteroid collisions, extensive volcanic lava flow have effectively filled up the craters. This has given rise to widespread plains in the near side. These plains on the near side offer a more favorable setting for space missions. This topographical advantages proves beneficial for space landers and rovers as they can operate relatively well on the level plane ground. This is why missions like Chandrayaan have opted to explore the near side. Another factor that influenced the decision of Chandrayaan was the necessity of maintaining direct line of sight communication with the earth. See a landing on the moon's far side would have led to a lack of direct communication. So to address this a relay system like an orbiter is needed to bridge the gap. Now you may ask me about Chandrayaan 2 orbiter. Yes, the Chandrayaan 2 orbiter is still active and it could have been repurposed as a relay. However, this would have required reorienting the Chandrayaan 2's orbit, moving it further away from the moon and introducing delays up to half a day in transmitting and receiving data from the Pragyan rover. This practical consideration resulted in choosing a landing site on the near side of the moon itself. So these are the two factors that resulted in choosing the near side of the moon for landing the Chandrayaan-3 mission. Okay? See, until now, China's Chang-4 lander is the only one to have successfully landed on the far side of the moon. Okay? 
See, although Chandrayaan-3 mission chose a safer option, there are some things that are special about this mission. Chandrayaan-3 has positioned its Vikram lander a mere 600 km away from the south pole of the moon's near side. This is the closest any mission has been to the moon's south pole. This region of the moon is called the permanently shadowed region where sunlight never reaches. This region is important from a scientific point of view as there is more possibility of encountering frozen water ice in this region. But you have to note here that the Vikram lander is not placed in the fully shadowed region. This is because the lander is solar powered and it needs sunlight to carry out its operation. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we understood about the near side and the far side of the moon. Then we saw two points that were taken into consideration in choosing near side for landing the Chandrayaan-2 lander. Finally, we saw the special attributes of the Chandrayaan-3 mission. Now with this, let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions. We have four practice prelims questions. Let us see them one by one. Let us take up the first question. Arjun Erigasi, D. Gukesh and Vidit Gujarati are affiliated with which specific sport? The correct answer for this question is option C, chess. See, please take down these names given here because we can expect a question regarding chess in our next prelims examination. Okay. Now moving on to the next question. This question is based on our BRICS discussion. Let us take up the first statement. The chairmanship of the BRICS rotates annually based on the English alphabet of first letter of the member countries. This statement is incorrect. The chairmanship of the BRICS rotates annually based on the acronym BRICS and not based on English alphabet. So statement 1 is incorrect. Moving on to the second statement. The Asian Development Bank was established based on the agreement of BRICS nations. This statement is incorrect. It is actually the new development bank which was established based on the agreement of BRICS nation. Okay. Moving on to the third statement. So far, India has chaired the BRICS grouping only twice. This statement is also incorrect. India has chaired the BRICS group three times till now. India has chaired on 2012, 2016 and 2021. Since all the statements given here are incorrect, the correct answer here is option D, none. Moving on to the next question. Here three statements are given. We have to find how many of the statements are representing the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Let us take up the first statement. A dispute between the government of India and one or more states. This statement is correct. It is one of the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Moving on to the second statement. A dispute regarding the election to either house of the parliament or that of the legislature of the state. This statement is incorrect because the election disputes can also be heard in the respective high courts in the state. So it is not the exclusive original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Moving on to the third statement, a dispute between two or more states. This falls under the exclusive original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Since only two statements given here are correct, the correct answer here is option B, only two. Moving on to the last question. This question is based on our Chandrayaan-3 discussion. It is a assertion reasoning question. Look at the first statement. Only one side of the moon is visible to us Earth. This statement is correct. Only one side, that is the near side, is always visible to Earth. Moving on to the second statement. The moon moves around the Earth in about 27 days and takes exactly the same time to complete one spin. Actually, this statement means that the moon is tidally locked with earth. Okay. This is why the moon takes the same number of days to complete one revolution around the earth and the same number of days to complete one rotation in its own axis. This is the reason why from the earth we can see only one side of the moon, that is the near side of the moon. Since the statement 2 is correct and also correctly explains the statement 1, the correct answer is option A. Both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct and statement 2 is the correct explanation for statement 1. The main question based on today's discussion is displayed here. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section. If you like today's video, like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding UPC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.